Uh, so as Ian said, I'll be talking about this OECD work that I've chaired over the last couple of years. We published a report in the middle of this year, uh, which is linked in the notes for this session. Uh, and so most of what I'll be talking about comes from that report. So you can uh, get uh, original citations and diagrams uh, from that, etc. Uh, the aim of the report was to make recommendations to policymakers because that's the level at which the OECD works. Uh, every year, the Global Science Forum brings together uh, national departments. Australia is represented in those discussions to understand where their areas of interest are, and they convene a number of these uh, expert groups uh, to work on a particular issue for a couple of years uh, and to make recommendations to policymakers. So the contents of the report was firstly to look at what kind of data actually existed about what's needed uh, in terms of a digital workforce in research. Uh, it makes some recommendations that are around five focus areas and makes them to a number of actors, including uh, universities and governments. Whilst this work started more than two years ago, uh, it's worthwhile noting that COVID-19 has actually highlighted the importance of it and I hope some of you are seeing this in your workplaces that uh, we now increasingly understand the importance of digital skills for everyone but also uh, for the research sector uh, and the need for open science uh, to, to enable that. One of the key questions when we started was what do we know, what's the evidence about the need for a digitally skilled workforce and I'm sure most of you on the call today uh, share with me a, 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 a intuitive understanding that we are in desperate need of that, but also uh, appreciate that sometimes it's hard to find the data to substantiate that. So we did some uh, looking around for what did exist, and this is a cross-section of a few of them. Uh, so for example, the European Union had a study that showed that uh, there was a cost of not having fair research, and therefore that having uh, better digital skills would, would enable uh, more fair research. Uh, there was a study done by the US, R1 universities, which are research intensive universities, which found on average uh, each university only had two data librarians per university. And some work that the RDC commissioned and published last year uh, showed that in Australian universities, you might have one research data manager uh, to 65 uh, researchers and even worse uh, for software engineering. We found some other studies uh, that showed how important a number of researchers said uh, um, either digital skills or the ability to use some types of digital tools were. Uh, there's some examples there uh, that are all detailed in the report. To move our work forward, we did some in-depth case studies of 13 uh, organisations that were engaged in best practice and ARDC uh, was included in that list uh, so that we could identify uh, both the commonalities across them, but also draw out specific examples of where organisations were doing things differently and having successes. Our analysis found that there were five key focus areas that need to be considered. Uh, so if we look at that diagram, uh, in the top right, there's a light blue backgrounded section called defining needs uh, that we need digital skills, uh, frameworks and roles. And this is where the OECD work had really started from. In fact, that was the initial focus in itself. And as we continued our analysis, we realised that that was only one part of the puzzle. And there were four other uh, key pieces, uh, provision of training, uh, community development, uh, career paths and, and broader enablers in, in policy, etc. In terms of the first area, I think we've all seen different variations of how to define uh, the various roles that are emerging and what they encompass. Uh, this was a very simplistic overview that we came up with. Uh, you would have seen in Arena's slides a uh, much more complex one. Uh, I am sure there is many different ways to represent these different roles and their overlaps as there are people on this call. Uh, so uh, this was one um, way to delineate it. Provision of training was an area that we really highlighted strongly because whilst there's been conversation for now a number of years about how we need more skilled researchers and research support professionals like data stewards and research software engineers, there's actually been very little thought about how, how to provide the trainers uh, that will enable that upskilling. And interestingly, also some silo development between uh, the development of those trainers and the development of people who can teach undergraduates or master's program in data science. So that's an area uh, that still needs a lot of thought. Community building uh, was also uh, strongly identified as important, that it's not just enough to upskill people, 
uh, that people need to identify with other people in the same role. They need communities where they can engage with those uh, other people, uh, create networks, uh, share knowledge and, and learn from each other's. And that uh, those kind of communities are needed uh, in a wide range of areas, including the digital science leaders, leaders uh, that as these new roles keep emerging, uh, they need, if you like, to be able to find their tribe Career paths and reward structures uh, is an area which I'm happy to say has uh, received a bit more attention, say, over the last uh, year, uh, but certainly equally important. As I emphasize again, it's not important to, to just, it's not enough to just have uh, the people in the research sector with the skills. Uh, they also need to be rewarded uh, for doing so. So the report then makes recommendations for a range of actors uh, from national governments through to universities and research institutions. I'll just go through a, a couple, uh, but you can look at the document and, and look at the detail and maybe some of these would be useful for advocating within your own organisation. First of all, we made one overview recommendation to any organisation that it would be useful to understand uh, your own uh, digital workforce capacity in terms of a maturity model. This is a very simplistic maturity model, but uh, when we developed it about six months ago, we couldn't have named any organization or country that was at level two, that was looking at all of those areas. Uh, there's been a lot of organizations at level one, uh, looking at some of those areas and some of them are best practice in how they address those. But it was difficult to find uh, an example uh, where uh, someone was looking at all of those areas and particularly uh, in a coordinated way. In October 2020, I'd say uh, possibly that is now emerging that we could find examples uh, that are beginning, that, that are looking at all five and beginning to look at the coordination across all of them. So one of the recommendations we made to national governments uh, was that uh, there needs to be understanding of the importance of all five areas. Uh, and that governments uh, could support uh, analysis of national needs and responses uh, to provide some kind of national strategy. So it would be interesting to consider uh, how Australia uh, might address this going forward, uh, particularly if something like the National uh, Research Infrastructure Roadmap proceeds next year, and if it includes a skills section in the same way that it did in 2016, uh, it will be interesting to see if some of this uh, begins to get picked up. There are recommendations uh, to universities uh, on some points that, again, are probably fairly obvious to most, of pe most people on the call. Uh, there needs to be provision of training. There needs to be development of, of new career paths. And there certainly are some examples of, of organisations in Australia that are looking at that. And that uh, strange looking graphic down the bottom is a screenshot from some discussions that have been convened across Australian universities uh, by the University of Melbourne and University of Sydney on, on what they call third spaces, uh, the people who aren't exclusively researchers or exclusively uh, professional staff within universities. Uh, so that's a conversation worthwhile being a part of if, if this is uh, an area of interest for you. A few other um, areas uh, or initiatives to be aware of if you haven't come across them um, before. Uh, there are organisations that focus on training like the Carpentries internationally and have a strong presence in Australia. There are organisations that look at career path developments such as the Society of Research Software Engineering and there's a chapter for Australia and New Zealand. Uh, the RDA has an interest group on professionalising data stewardship, uh, Go Fair have work as well. And the final logo there is the Academic Data Science Alliance, uh, which is yet uh, another focus, mostly US-based, uh, but international. And uh, a lot of the US organisations share how they are, are developing best practice in a number of these areas. If Australia did want to look at uh, probably the country that's leading uh, in terms of national initiatives, Netherlands is, is the guiding light, uh, and they have a fantastic white paper called Room for Everyone's Talent. Netherlands have the, exam have the advantage that they only have five universities, so it's a little bit easier to get them moving towards a, a new future. And in fact, uh, Netherlands have committed that in five years' time, those universities will be using open science criteria as their main means of, of assessing uh, research outcomes. There's a few other examples there uh, from US, UK and Latin America who are also uh, doing interesting things. 
I probably should add that uh, probably every country is doing something interesting in one particular part. Uh, that's just an example of a few. Uh, also, to be useful to be aware if you if you haven't come across some of the international principles or policy instruments uh, that uh, sit around all of this work. Uh, Dora of the San, Fran San Francisco Declaration uh, is an excellent piece, although only one Australian university has signed up to that, the University of Melbourne, although there are some other Australian organisations, uh, such as the Australian Academy of Science, who are signed up. So Bonn Declaration is, is a good one to be aware of because the group of eight universities all signed up to that. So if your university is a signatory, uh, that might give you some leverage uh, to ask internally uh, what your university is doing uh, to achieve that. And the Hong Kong Principles uh, is even more recent, but useful in that it provides, uh, and that's what the diagram is on the left, uh, some sample indicators that could be used uh, to evaluate uh, research assessment outcomes in place of the traditional uh, journal impact factors, etc. Other international works, uh, there's an open science registry being developed. Uh, there's an event at RDA on that next week. <clears throat> Irina's talked a lot about the European Open Science Cloud uh, working group that I'm also involved in. And I would highlight in that uh, she, she talked a lot about one of the strands, which is looking at competence centres. I would highlight to Australia that language is now widely accepted in Europe and increasing. And it would be worthwhile Australia considering or Australian organisations considering if they want to start utilising uh, some of that terminology as well uh, to make what they're doing uh, more readily um, recognisable by the Europeans. The Knowledge Exchange Openness Profile is, is another good example looking at how we can actually record what people's research outputs are in, in, in a range of digital objects and how that can be integrated uh, with your ORCID ID. Uh, and, uh, uh, yep, and that's all the examples there. So finally, uh, just a question to pose to you all. Uh, Irina mentioned that the EOSC, uh, EOSC as a whole is developing a document called the, and I'm going to forget what the acronym stands for, uh, the Strategic Reward, uh, Strategic Roadmap for Innovation and Assessment or something. That's not even close. Maybe Irina can type it in. Anyway, she, she mentioned this document. Uh, that's being developed uh, that provides a roadmap on how EOSC is going to be moving forward over the next couple of years. And uh, one of its key goals is that open science becomes the new normal. So I just end by uh, challenging you all to think about uh, how your organisation is moving towards that goal and uh, how you can support, that, support it to do that. Thank you.